Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you. Yeah, just keep your hands up so we can make sure we get that to you. It is so good to see you today at Grace Church Cary. I'm so glad that you are here. I'm so glad that those who are online, our online church family, that you're joining us today. We welcome you, and we thank you for being with us. And if you are new, um, if this is you, maybe you're new today, your first time here, or maybe you're relatively new, uh, know that we are so glad that you are here. We're glad to have you with us this day. And uh, we hope that you have an enjoyable experience and that you experience the love and the presence of God. I do want to make you aware of a couple things real quick. First, uh, 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 Marlene was involved in an accident uh, this week, and uh, the car looks really, really bad. But she doesn't. She looks good. The Lord has protected her, and we thank God for his protection in your life. And and you may remember that we did a... um, a few weeks ago, we, we, we started just a little uh, uh, thing for giving to Grace Church in Espanol. We, we launched Grace Church in Espanol. Uh, Daniel and Teresa might are uh, serving uh, with that, and uh, they're here with us today. But uh, I challenge you to, to give beyond what you would normally give. You've already generously give to the church and support the church. And I just want to say thank you for your response to that. Because of your giving, we've raised nearly $8,000 uh, to support the work. And I want to say thank you so much for that. That's uh, such a wonderful thing. Thank you so much. Um, And my understanding is Pastor Silvano is supposed to be here early April, permanently. And then Andre and the family should be coming about a month or so later. So we're really excited for that. So thank you for what you do. Uh, We're beginning a new series today uh, that's going to take us to Easter Sunday. And we'll wrap it up on Easter Sunday. Uh, What we're doing is we are going to examine... Uh, what Jesus had to say about the kingdom of God. Now, that leaves me about six weeks or so, uh, Sundays, that I get to share on that. And that's really not a lot to talk about, uh, to talk about the kingdom of God, because when, when you look at Jesus and what he talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find out that the kingdom of God was a topic that he spoke on a lot, around 118 times. So I'm not going to get 100. I, I could do 118 sermons, in other words, out of, uh, out of this. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you up until Easter uh, uh, about the kingdom of God. But when you think about the kingdom of God, what comes to mind? Well, that was the, uh, the little box on the, on the wall. That was nice. Um, what comes to mind when you think about the kingdom of God? My mind goes to uh, the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples when he said, I, I quote it in King James language, so if you're not used to King James, I apologize. It's just what I learned growing up. Jesus taught them to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when you think about what Jesus is saying there, when he's talking about the kingdom of God, he is talking about the reign of God that is happening in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is on earth as it is in heaven, what he's praying is that the reign of God will become a reality in our life and in our experience, that God's will will be our will and we will live it out here on earth as his will is lived out in heaven. Makes sense, doesn't it? Okay, I just want to make sure you're with me. Uh, You will remember that uh, God had set up a kingdom, Israel, and, and the greatest king in Israel was King David. King David, as he, uh, God made a promise to him. He said, David, he says, I, I'm, I'm making a promise to you. One of your ancestors will sit on the kingdom uh, and on the throne, and his reign is not going to be short. It's not going to be temporal. His kingdom and his reign will be forever. And generation after generation after generation looked for the fulfillment of this promise of a Messiah, of a Christ, of a King, of a Savior, of a Deliverer, and it hung in the air. And that brings us to Mark chapter 1, where Jesus, we, where Mark brings us to the story of Jesus. And we're going to be in Mark 1, verse chapter 1, verses 1 and 14 and 15. And Mark starts, and this is what he says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus who? Christ, the Son of God. In other words, the promise that hung for generation after generation after generation, people awaiting for the fulfillment 
Mark is telling us it happened and it has been fulfilled in Jesus. He says it is the gospel about Jesus Christ. I want you to know that the word gospel also means good news. So typically in the Bible, if you see the word gospel, it means good news. And if you see the word good news, it means gospel. They're both from the Greek word euangelion. Uh, and, and sometimes translating things can get lost. And this is how they, this is what the, uh, the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament says, that, that sometimes they have to translate it in other languages to communicate the idea of good news. They say the gospel or the good news must be rendered by a phrase. For example, news that makes one happy. Information that causes one joy. Words that bring smiles. Or a message that causes the heart to be sweet. So I hope that you capture a little idea, and I'm going to talk about it more in a little bit, but I hope it captures a little idea about what the gospel is. It's good news. It's not bad news. I, I, I've had enough bad news in my life. How about you? I could use some good news. Amen? Yeah, that's me. And so we have that in the gospel about Jesus Christ. It is good news for you and me. After John, this is verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now, I, I, I went from verse 1 to verse 14 because of the, the in-between part is talking a lot about John and his role, and, and I, I want to get to Jesus. Are you okay with that? Okay. So he says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. Now, John, uh, or Mark doesn't immediately tell us why John went to prison. Uh, but he tells us a few chapters later, and the reason why John the Baptist, you may know him better as John the Baptist, because there's quite a few Johns in the Bible, so we'll just say John the Baptist. The reason why John the Baptist went to prison was because he had this habit of publicly stating to Herod, who was the ruler of that area, saying, Herod, you're in sin, and it's not right for you <laughs> to be married to your brother's wife. Herod didn't like that. His wife liked it even less. And so when the opportunity came, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and that's how John died. Which brings up an interesting point that you and I need to think about for just a moment. Throughout history, God's people have spoken prophetically to politicians and to culture, to what was happening in the world around them. They spoke out against sin. Whether it was sexual sin, it was injustice, it was idolatry, whether it was people being self-serving, who lacked love, who treated others wrongly, and ultimately, it's all summed up in this part, it was disobedience to God and God's command, okay? And I have a question for you. This, if you read the Old Testament, and I've been reading a lot through the Old Testament uh, since last year into this year, and, and one of the things, if you read the stories of the judges, it's amazing how often the prophets spoke out against the injustice of the, the political leaders and the people and the way that they behaved and treated other people, breaking God's commands. Does the church, here's the question, does the church have a responsibility to, to speak prophetically to our culture? I think if you ask John, and all the other prophets, they would tell you, yes. But understand, John and all the other prophets would also tell you that doing so comes at a personal cost. John preached a very simple message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And he offered a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And what he was doing is he was preparing people's hearts for the coming of the Lord, for a, a Jesus coming. And he was the promised forerunner of Isaiah, announcing that the kingdom of God had come. He was what Isaiah called was the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. So John, what he does here is he's just making use of John's imprisonment. And what he's doing is he's moving John to the back of the story. But he's moving John to the back of the story so that he can bring Jesus to the forefront because that's why John came. What does Jesus say? What does he proclaim? He proclaims the good news of God's kingdom. 
And here's the thing that I want you to see. See, he proclaimed the good news of God, right? Listen, this is the thing I want us all to understand. Now, you may not agree with this. You might, and that's fine. It's all right. But I'm telling you, this is what the Scripture teaches, and this is what Jesus taught, that he is uniquely qualified to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom because he is the Son of God. Jesus and Jesus alone is uniquely qualified to talk to us about the kingdom of God. He's the only one. Because he's the only one who's been to heaven, that's what he said. And he came to earth, born of a virgin, fully God, fully man. And he came to talk to us and to share with us and to tell us that the kingdom of God has come. And he is able to adequately talk to us about it because he is the Christ, the Son of God. So he is the only one, I want to say this again, he's the only one qualified to tell us about it because he's been there. He came to us, and he tells us what it is, what it is like, how we enter it, and how we are to live as people in the kingdom. And so Jesus says in verse 15, he says, the time has come. Would you say time? And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Time is a funny thing, isn't it? It's, it's amazing how quickly sometimes time passes, and sometimes it just seems to crawl, even though it's consistent all the time. <laughs> Isn't it strange how that happens? It's, it's funny how that we can take it for granted. We can put it to good use. We can waste away time. And how we spend our time matters because we never get it back, and so it's incumbent upon us to invest it wisely. And we can ask, what time is it? And I would tell you it's 1116, Right? But that kind of time is different than when your pregnant wife looks at you and in a serious voice says, we need to go to the hospital. It's time. See, that's a whole different kind of time, isn't it? Yeah. And and, and that's important for us to understand because what time is it is a a chronos time. It's it's a chronological time of day. What time is it? Well, it's 11, 16. It's it's, uh, noon. It's it's afternoon, mid-afternoon. It's evening. It's midnight. It's 3 in the morning. See, it's all chronological. But there's another kind of time. It's time when when your wife says it's time. When when they say to you it's time to depart. It's time uh, to start something new. It's a a new season. It's a time and a new season. And the Bible has another word for time. Not just chronos, but it has another one called kairos. K-A-I-R-O-S is how you would transliterate it. And it literally describes a decisive moment in time. The baby is coming now. (laughs) It's time, right? Decisive moment. The plane is leaving now. The ship is departing now. It is a decisive moment in time. Now, let me ask you a question. Jesus said, the time has come. Do you think he used Kronos or Kairos? He used Kairos. He's telling us that the time has come. This is a decisive moment in time. The kingdom of God is near. And what Jesus is telling us is this, that there is this inbreaking of God's kingdom on earth, that the prophetic hope of Messiah has become a reality, that the reign of God has come to man, to humanity. That's what I mean when I say man. In other words, with the arrival of Jesus, the kingdom of God is not only near, it is here. It has broken into our time. Eternity has now come to earth. All right? It's, it's not like it's close but not yet arrived. It means it's here. It's been fulfilled that the kingdom of God is now here with us. He's announcing that the time of God's visitation, the time of God's working, the time that God's kingdom is advancing onto earth and breaking into our world that the kingdom of God has decisively come through Jesus into the kingdom of men. And what does a decisive moment in time require? Action. It requires a response. Yes. And Jesus expected an immediate response to this announcement. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Let me ask you a question. When you go out to eat, and I don't mean like fast food. I'm talking about like a sit-down restaurant. You walk in. They greet you. Usually the host does or hostess. And they take you to your table, right? Y'all with me? All right. They sit you down. They hand out the menus, and they take your drink order. And then they usually ask you at that point in time, do you want an appetizer? 
and it depends on where I'm at and what I'm eating. Is that's the answer to that question. And, and so they say, all right, and they'll go, and they go and they get the drink orders and they come back and they hand it out. And then what time is it? It's time to order, right? It is time to order. The, and you might be able to say, listen, I'm not sure. I was busy talking. Can you give me a couple minutes? But somewhere along the line, they're going to come back, and it's going to be a decisive moment in time, and you have to decide. You can't sit there and him haw around, because, do I want the steak or do I want the ribs? You've got to make a decision because you can't waste that person's time, right? No, there's a decisive moment in time, that, and it requires a response. It reminds me of Joshua when he had led the children of Israel into uh, uh, the children of Israel into Israel, the land of Palestine that God had promised Abraham. And they had conquered a, a large section of it and they, had, they claimed it as their own. And he called all the people of Israel together. And he says to them, he says something very important to them. He says, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Will it be the gods of your forefathers or the gods of the Amorites? And then he said, as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. You see, what he was doing is, it was a kairos moment. He was calling for a specific action or a response to this moment, to this day. He was calling for a response. And the Israelites responded and said, we will serve the Lord. They responded appropriately. Decisive moments in time require an immediate response. You get over here, I'm going to bust your rear. That's a decisive moment in time. I never understood why parents go, one, two. What are you counting for? Didn't you just tell them? Make them do it. If they don't do it, there's consequence. Isn't that right? I'm sorry. I'm moving on. I, I just don't understand the counting down. If, if your word isn't good enough, what good is counting? You're just giving them a chance to, to continue in their rebellion. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Decisive moments in time require an immediate response. You can't put it off any longer. You can't hem haw around. And indecision at some point in time, at that time, becomes a decision. You have to choose. Jesus is talking about the reign of God breaking into the human experience. And what is our response to this moment in time? How should we respond? Jesus tells us. Listen to what he says. He says, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus tells us there's two things that we need to do. There are two imperatives in this statement. There is repent and believe. Would you say repent and believe? Yeah, repent and believe. This is what Jesus says this moment in time requires, that we repent and that we believe the good news. I grew up, uh, if you don't know, I, I I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I, I grew up in the Pentecostal holiness denomination. And uh, I heard the word repent a lot. And there was, uh, whether intentional or not, it's something that I observed a kid and as I grew up. What I found out was that uh, repentance was largely as associated with a, a great sadness or sorrow for sin. And, and usually uh, it, w it was accompanied by a, a lot of tears, utter brokenness, and a lot of snot. That's why, that's why churches often keep uh, tissues up at the front, not just because sometimes people come to pray because of great things are going on, but when people repent, sometimes it gets really messy. <laughs> and so you can understand my confusion when I was talking with a pastor and he told me that he repented of fried chicken. Because the image of going, <laughs> I can't eat it anymore. It just didn't make any sense to me, right? He repented. But what happened was is this. Is, is in his life, he had gotten overweight. He was unhealthy. And the Lord convicted him of it. And he repented. He, he meant it. He repented of fried chicken. He decided, this is what I would normally do, but I'm not doing it anymore. I've had a change of heart and a change of mind about what I eat and how I eat. And he was dead serious. Jesus says that we need to repent because the kingdom of God, the reign of God has arrived. And we repent. Why? Because all of us have done this. We have all lived our lives doing what we want to do. We've been the king of our own kingdom, and we didn't really care what God had to say. Amen? 
We have, I have. I have. Because Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ who brings the kingdom of God to us, we have to repent, <clears throat> have a change of heart and mind about, what we are, uh, about how we are living and what we or who we are living for. And so I want to ask you a couple questions real quick. Who has the say in your life? Who governs your decisions? Are you living your life in light of God's kingdom? Or are you the king of your own kingdom, living your life as you please? You know, Dietrich, we have to repent. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. <clears throat> he said, if you board the wrong train, it is no use running along the corridor in the other direction because you're on the wrong train. It's still taking you in the wrong way. <clears throat> what do you have to do? you got to get off the train, right? You, you're going this way. You repent. What does that mean? You go the other way. You go the right way. And that's what it is. There's this scene in uh, the Infinity War. Anybody like Infinity War Marvels? A few people. Thank you for that. I, I, and the men are the one that respond. That's great. You know, that's great. Uh, there's this scene where they're on the planet where Thanos is. And if you haven't seen this, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling something for you. I, I think it's time that you should have seen it by now. <clears throat> But they're on the planet, and it's Iron Man, Peter Parker, and Doctor Strange. And then the Guardians of the Galaxy show up on there, right? And they're starting to get in a tussle, and they say, like, who do you serve? And Chris Pratt plays Star-Lord. He goes, what am I supposed to say, Jesus? Yes. Yes, exactly who you're supposed to say. You're supposed to, I serve Jesus, because when you repent, that's what you're saying. Jesus, I make you my Savior. I make you my Lord. I make you my Master, and I serve you. And if He isn't King, Master, and Lord of your life, repent means we make a change by making Him the King, Master, and Lord of our life. That's repent. The second word that Jesus commands us to do is believe. Believe. Believe means to trust with your whole heart. It doesn't mean some kind of intellectual assent. You believe something as if your whole life, your eternity depends on it. And you put all of your weight on that. And, and really what we're saying to Jesus is when we believe in Him, we're saying, I'm putting my whole life, my whole, everything about me and my eternity, I am putting it on the claim that you are who you said you are and that you did what you said you would do. That's what it means to believe. That's what it means. It's trusting in that way. There was a, a class that was done, a professor was teaching, and the, he was explaining about the fulcrum, and, and he had this big, heavy ball. He had attached it to, by a rope to the ceiling, and, and he showed, you know, that the, the, the ball would do, and when it came back this way, it wouldn't go quite as far as where it started. You know what I'm talking about? As gravity started to grab. And he asked the class, he said, how many of y'all believe that? And, oh, yeah, yeah, we believe it. And so he chose a student. He says, I want you to stand right here. Stood it there, and he put the ball right up against the guy's face. And he let it go. And the ball went, vroom, vroom, vroom. and as he got close, what do you think that student did? He bailed. Now, I have a question for you. Did he really believe it? Did he really believe about what the ball would do? See, we can say that we believe uh, exercise and diet are important. But if my diet is horrible and I never exercise, do I really believe it? I can say I believe financial planning and budgeting is an important thing to do. I might even make a budget and I might even get some financial counseling. But if I don't track my spending, if I, don't, I go into credit card debt and I spend more than I make, do I really believe it? You see, if you can say, you can say you really believe the reign of God has come in Jesus. But if you are living your life doing what pleases you, do you really believe it? Jesus, in essence, is saying to us, the reign of God has come. Trust me. Not me, but I'm, you know what I'm saying. Trust me. And the question is, do we really trust him? And this is an important question. It's a simple question, but it has a profound uh, application and impact on our life. 
right after verse 15, which we were looking at here, and it's, I'm not going to, you can read chapter 1 today if you want to go home and read it. It'd be great to do. Please do. I encourage you to. But right after this, Jesus goes and, and he finds uh, Peter and Andrew, and they're fishermen. And he says to them, follow me. Do you know what they did? They left behind all of their fishing gear and fishing equipment. They abandoned it to follow Jesus. He went a little further down the sea there. And he found James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They're at the boats working with their father in hired hands. And Jesus looks at James and John and he says, follow me. James and John look around. It's their dad. It's their business. It's hired hands. And they abandoned it all to follow Jesus. And according to church tradition and history, all four of them died as martyrs for their faith in Christ. Now, did they believe Jesus? Oh, you bet they did. You can believe that they did. Jesus says that we need to repent and believe the good news. The good news. Something that Jesus proclaimed, but it's also something about Jesus. It is the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. See, the gospel is about Jesus. He's not just announcing it. He is the gospel. How is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, news for, good news for you and me? Well, let's talk about that real quick. Timothy Keller in his book, King's Cross, which is a commentary on Mark, says this. And he's giving us something to understand about what it was in its ancient context when they used these words. A gospel was news of some event that changed things in a meaningful way. It would be like us. We have, uh, we're getting married, and we send out the announcement, right? And it's changing some things, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, an event that's going to change things. Or, or you send out, we've, we've had a child, and the announcement goes out, and boy, does that change things, right? Yeah, it really does. So imagine for a moment, this is what he says, the gospel was news of some event that changed things in a meaningful way. So there was something that happens in history that has an impact, a meaningful impact on people's lives. Imagine for a moment that you've been captured, you're a prisoner of war, you have no hope of escape, you're under guard by your enemies, you're, you are cut off from the world, you don't know what's happening in the world, and as far as you know, you're going to die right where you are. But one day... Some, a large group of soldiers comes up and the soldiers that were guarding you are gone and they sh pull down the prison walls. They open the doors where you've been in prison and they say to you, the war is over. You are free. You have in this uh, an event in time that has happened. The war is over and the meaningfulness of it is found in the fact that you are free. You see how the event has good consequences for a person's life. You see what I'm saying? It's like the Emancipation Proclamation that President Abraham Lincoln issued on January 1st, 1863. People who were held in slavery under the tyranny of it, this is what the part of the proclamation said, that all persons held as slaves, this is according to the archives of the government, within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. Think about for this the countless people that had been enslaved. You were nothing more than a piece of property. You were treated harshly, largely, and you were abused, sometimes raped. And you find word that the President of the United States has issued a decree saying that you are free. How does that make you feel to know that you are free? Now, I, I understand there's been some issues since then. I'm not trying to cover that. But understand what I'm saying. Something in history happens... <clears throat> And it has a meaningful uh, uh, thing for your life. And that is exactly what the gospel is. A historical event that is meaningful. You are free. And that's the gospel. Jesus, the Son of God, came proclaiming the kingdom of God, that the kingdom from eternity is broken to earth, our reality. <clears throat> In Genesis... <clears throat> In Genesis, we read how Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. And they enjoyed 
unhindered fellowship with God. And then they were confronted with a choice. They could obey God or disobey God. And what did they choose? Disobedience, right? They sinned. They decided to follow their own rules rather than the rules that God had given them. Even if it was just one rule. They couldn't even keep one rule. It's amazing. Don't touch the cake. Don't eat those cookies. And Just one rule. And we can't keep it. They wanted to be like God, so they made their own choice. That was a decisive moment in time. And it had consequences. Sin came into the world. And death through sin. And I want you to understand something from the very beginning. Sin is not just something that we do. The Bible talks about sin as a a principle, a power that has dominion over all of our lives. And it is something that we have to be delivered from. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a governing principle. It's a, a power that is at work in the life of all humans who are born. And there's nothing that we can do about it. We can't deliver ourselves from this sin principle. A lot of religions will say, well, if you do this, 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 and this, then you're good. But that's not what Jesus taught. And the important thing, the reason why we have good news is this, is that Jesus came and he gave his life for us. Because we are incapable of saving ourselves, he did what we could not do. See, we need a Savior to save us from our sin. And this is why Jesus came. This is why He lived. This is why He died. This is why He rose again. And this, my friends, is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It is a historical event. Jesus lived, died, and rose again. And because He lived, died, and rose again, We can be forgiven and free. We are free from the penalty of sin and we are free from the principle of sin. Because if God came and says, I forgive you, and then he doesn't deliver us from the bondage of sin, What good is forgiveness? He came to forgive us our sins and to free us from sin. So that now there is no condemnation because we are in Christ Jesus. We are free from guilt. We are free from shame. We are free from condemnation because on the cross, Jesus Christ bore our sin and paid the price for it. It's so many other religions, it's on us to be, do the things to make us right with God. And they'll tell you it's up to you. You have to do this, 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 and this. They'll give you a checklist of things that you have to do. And that if you'll do that, that's, that, then you'll be all right with God. Can I tell you, that's not good news. That's bad news. Because we are incapable of saving ourselves. Listen, I'm, and I mean this sincerely. If Jesus came to be our Savior, why would He come if we could save ourselves? Why would He go through the horrendous pain and suffering on the cross and death if you and I had the ability to save ourselves and pay the penalty for our sins by being good? See, your good, my good, no matter how good, will never be good enough. That's bad news, isn't it? But the good news is that because of Jesus, you don't have to do it. He did it for you and me. And that's the good news, that Jesus has come. He is our Savior. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is our only hope for salvation. And apart from Him, we have no good news. What we could not do, Jesus did for us. And if we believe in Him, we have eternal life. And do you know why God sent Jesus? Do you know why Jesus did what he did? Because he loves you and me. 
And I cannot think of a sweeter news that I could tell you today than you are loved by God. That God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son so that we would not perish, but if we believe in Him, we could have eternal life. That's gospel. That's good news. You are loved by God. You think of something in life that you love more than anything else, God loves you more. You are loved by God. Today is a decisive moment in time. It is a kairos moment. In kairos moments, decisive moments in time require an immediate response. Jesus is calling for a response from all of us today. Paul told the church in Corinth, he said, Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Do you know what he's saying? It's a Kairos moment right here, right now. Now is the time of God's favor. God's favor is here today for you in this place. And it is the day of salvation. He has come today to rescue you and to save you. And the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 4, verse 7, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Because here's what's going to happen. And I'm just going to tell you honestly. If you do not, if you're here and, and you don't accept Christ as your favor, if you don't repent and believe in him, and you, can, you have the right to make that choice. I'm not trying to force you, okay? I'm just telling what's going to happen is if you don't repent and believe the good news, what happens is you harden your heart towards God. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to respond because God absolutely loves you. And he demonstrated that love by giving Christ for us. So today I want to encourage you to repent and believe the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the message of the kingdom. And it is good news. God has come. The kingdom is here. You are loved by God, and He invites you into a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And what you have to do is repent and believe. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? Today, if you're here and God is speaking to you, you just feel like, yeah, you know, that's me. I need to repent and believe. Then do that right now, right where you are. Just, just call out, say, God, I, I know I haven't been living life right. I haven't been doing what you want me to do. I've been my own king in my life, doing what pleases me. But I believe that Jesus came and he gave his life so that I could be forgiven. And I believe that. And I'm going to stake my life and my eternity on it. Jesus, I believe in you. If you repent and believe the good news, you have eternal life. And if you did that today, after service, would you let somebody know? See Pastor Kathy, see me. Let us know about this important moment in your life. Heavenly Father, thank you that the gospel is good news. I know in my own life there have been times when I was, I was tired, I was weary of sin. I realized that I was not living my life for you. And in your grace and mercy, you forgave me. And you offer that same grace and mercy for all of us today. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins so that through his sacrifice we could be forgiven. Thank you that because of Jesus our guilt is gone, our shame is removed, our sin is forgiven. And now we are free to live in your kingdom, to live a life that honors and pleases you. Thank you for such an incredible love. Jesus, that you would lay down your life for us. And that is what you did. What manner of love, Father, that you have given to us that because of Jesus we are called children of God. And that is what we are. And we rejoice in that and we celebrate it today 
as we remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. If you would get your communion elements ready. That Jesus, on the night that he, he was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. He did what he did for you and for me. Take and eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is being poured out for the remission of sins. It was for you and for me. Would you take and drink in remembrance of him? Heavenly Father, thank you again for your son, Jesus. We acknowledge today it's not because of anything that we have done, but it's because of your love and because of Jesus that we are saved. We are children of God. And we live in that and we want to celebrate that today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With hearts of gratitude. And we will spend all eternity giving thanks to you for all that you have done for us in Christ. As we go from this place, I ask and pray that you would help us to be people who share the good news with others. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Pastor Kathy.